Hello. Testing. Sounds good. For the blue sheets, we're using the same um, etherpad. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. My microphone was working, but my headphones were not. Ah, that's what it is. Great. For the Etherpad, um, we're just going to use the same one. And do we want to send it twice? Yeah, I think we need to get people going twice on the um, yep. blue sheet, yeah. I'll make a new section for that. Okay, just maybe get stuck in a big line and yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll do it today at the top and push everything else down or sure. Let's see. Let's see how WebEx is tonight. Can you see Safari with the agenda? Is it an appropriate size? Um, it is only half the screen. It's less than half the screen. That's so weird. I wonder how it determines. Oh, we should number these. Yeah. I guess I have to make it like my whole screen here to make it work. That's really annoying. Yep, that works. Sharing a single application in my experience is really iffy with this particular tool. 
it, it does not rescale. It's annoying. It does on other systems, I think. Um, oh, it does it? Okay, I haven't had it. I, from what I've heard, it's supposed to do it on Windows and stuff, but I think the problem is that applications on the Mac include technically the menu bar, and so they scale to include the entire menu bar means they don't scale up. That's annoying. No, we'll have to deal with it. I think if you full screen it or like maximize the window on the Mac, it works all right because then that addresses that scaling difference. Yeah, uh, that's that's effectively what I've done. I've just I have an a, absurdly large screen, and I I would like to use it for other things. Ah, yes. No, why would you want to do something like useful like that? That's just silly. The user's always wrong. You're holding it wrong. Mm. All right. Let's see. As a reminder, we're on Jabber as well. Hello. Nice to meet you. Can you hear me? Yes, Roberto. Hello. Hello. And yes, please fill out your Attendance on the Etherpad. Okay, so it is now the top of the hour. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the HTTP Working Group Virtual Interim Meeting. Uh, I'm Mark Nottingham. I'm going to be running the slides. Tommy Pauly is going to be running the queue. Uh, we have five agenda items to do uh, to get through and about an hour and 15 minutes for them. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the blue sheets, uh, as they are, are on Etherpad. Can everyone see my my uh, uh, Safari window still? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so please uh, add your name to the Etherpad. Uh, you can either stay in Etherpad and help to uh, uh, take minutes, or you can uh, uh, put your name in and then please uh, uh, close it so we don't have too many people on the Etherpad at one time. <clears throat> Do we have a volunteer to take minutes? Look, there's a list of names over here. What could I do with it? Uh, let's see who's actually talking today. Ah. Peter Wu has volunteered. Thank you very much, Peter. Can anyone help him? Great, Justin, thank you very much. If everyone else could pitch in, make sure they stay on track, that'd be much appreciated. 
So we have scribes. Uh, we know where the blue sheets are. Uh, as a reminder, this meeting is under the ITF note well terms. These are the terms in which we participate regarding things like intellectual property, code of conduct, anti harassment, so forth and so on. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, please use your favorite internet search engine to find it by searching for ITF note well. And scribe or scribes, feel free to interject anytime if you need clarification or directions. Um, agenda bashing, we've got signed HTTP messages with Annabelle, then secondary certs with Mike Bishop, digest headers with Lucas, uh, 6265 bits with Mike West, and then finally advisory content length for HTTP from yours truly. Uh, any agenda bashing? Hi, this is Barry. Just uh, can we take a minute to talk about um, uh, header structure, getting, clearing the discusses on header structure, or is that just something you, you've got to deal with? Um, so I sent an email to you and to the uh, ADs with outstanding uh, discusses asking if they needed, if, if the changes were adequate or if they needed something else. I'd heard okay, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll beat up on the other ADs then. And client hints still needs uh, some response to the last round of comments before I let it go, but it has no discusses. I don't condone violence against dairy directors, but what <laughs> happens? happens? So, thank you. Proceed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, Annabelle, uh, I didn't get any slides from you. Are you just going to do this uh, by talking? I emailed them out this morning. Uh, apologies for the late. I did Gen not receive anything. Uh, I think it was just like 10 minutes ago. So, we it, was, it was like. Oh, oh, yeah. Your morning, not my morning. Oh, okay. yes, my morning. Sorry. Uh, yeah. West Coast here. So. Apologies that my brain is a bit addled. Um, okay, one moment then. Let me see if I can make this work. I can also present them if uh, you want to make me a presenter. That is also a thing I can do. We've had a lot of feedback that that doesn't work very well. So That's we'll... fair. Microsoft is currently trying to open them, and there we go. All right, let me just figure out sharing for this. And while we're waiting, just as a reminder for people how to manage the queues, if you would like to speak, um, you can type in plus Q in the WebEx chat um, and minus Q if you want to get out of line. Um, and I'm going to assume that if you do plus Q during the middle of the talk, that it's a clarifying question and we'll try to get you inserted at spot. Do, uh, uh, Tommy, are you going to be watching the queue and, and managing that or? Yeah, I'm going to be monitoring the queue. Awesome, cool. Okay. Um, uh, so just let's... one thing for for folks, um, because we got the slides late, we'll get them up on a data tracker in the repo right after the meeting. Sorry about that. So take away, Annabelle. Okay, uh, let's get started. So uh, we're here to talk about signed HTTP messages. Um, my name is Annabelle Backman from AWS. Walking you through this. Try and go quickly because we've only got 15 minutes. So next. Um, Wait for the, yeah, so what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about ways to create durable signatures over HTTP message parts. So selectively uh, identifying parts of the request to sign, uh, signing those and attaching that to a uh, HTTP message so that that signature uh, can survive all the various uh, transformations and mangling that happens to requests as, and responses as they go from uh, sender to recipient. Next. So what does that look like? Um, step one, as I say, we, we identify uh, the elements to sign. Then next, we uh, turn those into a signature input uh, to create the content we're going to sign uh, to create our signature over. Uh, next. Uh, and then we generate that signature. We come up with some, uh, we create some metadata associated with it, and we put it into this signature header. Um, the, uh, the the signature header today basically just uh, in the current draft identifies the signature itself. Uh, the key used to create the digital signature or uh, MAC, uh, the um, message elements that are signed, uh, currently presented in the confusingly named headers parameter, and then a couple of other metadata properties like created, uh, expires, 
uh, and algorithm, which you don't see here as, as a default value. Um, OK, next. Just a quick overview of how the algorithm works uh, today, or how, how the, how the uh, mechanism works today. Uh, where are we at? Uh, it's been adopted as a working group item earlier this year. We put out the initial draft based on that. Uh, got it converted to Markdown, finally uh, have a PR out for um, uh, pulling that into the working group uh, repo. Uh, and then we've got a number of open issues that the working group gets to work on, um, many of which are now in issues in the repo. Thank you, uh, I think, Mark, for tagging those properly. Um, so uh, mostly today I want to get uh, feedback on an incoming change. Go to the next slide uh, to address some of the uh, open issues. Um, specifically, uh, replacing the signature, uh, the kind of bespoke signature uh, header field format with uh, structured headers. Um, so uh, go to the next slide. <clears throat> the current kind of proposal we're working with is um, that we'd like to get some feedback from the working group on before uh, going and submitting it as a, as a, a change, is a two-header field uh, format for, um, for this conversion. Uh, the first header field uh, currently in you know, the working name is signature input. Um, it replaces uh, the header parameter that identifies all the, the, the signed contents, uh, and it also holds the, the metadata associated with the signature. Um, and then we have a separate, the, the, the signature header field then just becomes a dictionary of signature identifiers to byte sequences. Um, so if you look in the example there on the right, you'll see that in the signature input, we it's a dictionary keyed off of this signature identifier token. Uh, the value is a is the list of identifiers for what content is signed. And then uh, further uh, metadata, like the key, the creation timestamp, is attached as parameters to that, that inner list. Um, and then the signature header is just a, a dictionary of the that same signature identifier to a sequence representing the signature itself. Um, next uh, slide. It looks like uh, Mark was yep. in the queue. Or... Want to jump in? Yeah, just while we're on this slide, um, in, in structured headers, um, keys, in other words, uh, you know, the uh, key value pairs, so for parameters and dictionaries, are forced lowercase. And I notice here you use key ID with a capital I. If that's an issue for you, we, we, no. we should, I mean, if you just don't want to force lowercase, we should talk about it because it's just about to go out the door. And we, uh, no, we, we can, it. we can, for, we, we can lowercase that key ID. That's just the, the capitalization on the parameter today. Uh, since we're changing, you know, dramatically changing the format here, I don't see any issue with making that force lowercase, you know, doing a, um, you know, snake casing or something like that, you know, whatever, whatever fits. I, yeah, I have no problem with that. No worries. Okay, great, thanks. Um, okay, uh, if no other questions, uh, go to the next slide. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, you know, some of the things I mentioned here, some of the drivers or the, the things we get out of doing structuring it this way um, that we're not doing today or that we're, that we're not showing there is um, this structure by by pulling the content identifiers for you know, what's been signed out into this you know, list. Um, it, uh, it, it gives us a nice way then to be able to start attaching parameters to those content identifiers themselves. I'm showing, giving kind of some examples of what that could look like, um, you know, where we could use a parameter to specify, say, that we're signing a specific cookie uh, within, you know, not, not the whole, not all the cookies, say a specific cookie, maybe it's used for authorization, for example, um, or we are, um, you know, maybe we'll show in another slide, uh, 
the possibility of having multiple signatures. Um, you, know, you could have these chains, so one signature actually incorporates, is actually signing over the previous signature. Um, or we can have parameters that allow us to identify uh, specific pieces of a, uh, st another structured header uh, value that we want to sign. For example, the first you know, four elements in a list, or the first or, the, or a specific key within a dictionary header, um, which would then give us a way to have structured headers that are kind of durable as potentially more items are added to those signature field, or sorry, to those uh, structured header fields um, as the uh, you know, request is mutated. Uh, next. And I mentioned multiple signatures. Um, and here's an example of what that might look like. You can imagine if we had that signature one uh, added at one point uh, to the to the message, uh, potentially another system downstream adds this signature two, um, you know, where we're signing over the original, the signature uh, you know, sig one and the X forwarded four header. So you can imagine maybe this is being added by a, a, a gateway. Uh, a system before it's forwarding it onto the the actual service host. Um, next, so this this takes care of lots of interesting problems for us. Uh, it gives us a chance to fix the confusingly named headers parameter name since it doesn't just include headers; it references other things. Headers is a bad name. Uh, it gets rid of our bespoke uh, field value format. Um, it gives us a nice, easy way to include. Signature parameters uh, within the signature lets us support multiple signatures. Uh, gives us with the uh, content identifier parameters gives us ways to reference parts of structured or unstructured headers, um, and it actually uh, potentially makes it easier for us to construct that signature input. Um, if we go to the next slide to show what that looks like. Um, currently, uh, we have kind of each parameter or each each uh, uh, signature metadata property kind of added as its own entry uh, in the signature input. Uh, we could potentially replace that by just including the structured header or the the, the structured uh, header inner list for that uh, signature as the first line of the signature input. So then we're kind of reusing uh, that same structure uh, within the signature input to make it a little bit easier to construct these things. So. And that guarantees that everything that we're putting in the in the uh, message to describe the signature is included in the signature input. Um, okay, I think that's my last slide on uh, on the per structured header stuff. I'd love to get feedback on that if there's questions or if there's uh, concerns or if we're doing anything right or wrong with structured headers. Um, Ecker? Uh, Eric was scroll up. So I have no opinion on what you should use structured headers or not. That seems fine. But the idea that you're picking out um, individual pieces of other headers which have semantic value and not covering the rest of them um, strikes me as making this problem of selective coverage even worse and almost impossible to secure evaluation of what the system is supposed to do. So uh, I, I can't say I'm super in favor of that. Mm -hmm. um, so is your concern that you know, if, if we're selecting kind of arbitrary parts of the headers, uh, then it's it's hard to kind of overall evaluate the overall security of effectiveness of uh, the solution. Uh, yes, and that actually building and actually building an implementation that doesn't anything coherent is going to be extremely difficult. Um, I mean, like this is exactly the mistake XML DSeq made of like trying to like cover individual pieces of things and then make attestation of the security. Um, and you know, like there's some really obvious mix and match attacks. I mean, I, I saw your initial slide where you're like, well, we're covering some of it, we're not covering you know content type. Um, and like you know, given we know there have been security vulnerabilities in the web because of not covering content type. Um, you know, um, you know, uh, punning attacks on monetized stuff and stuff like that. Like, um, you know, like it seems like it seems like we're going deeper and deeper down the hole of where reasoning about the security of the system is like nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I I I think you're absolutely right that you know in order to really understand if we're actually building a secure solution, we have to 
consider what we're what we're uh, including in that signature. The challenge with signing HTTP messages, though, is that I mean, everybody on this list. I don't have to tell you that the use cases for HTTP are many and varied, and uh, it, it, between any given use cases, there could be you know, tons of overlap or no overlap between which parts of the request are important, which ones aren't from a you know, security, uh, you know, application level semantic standpoint. Uh, which one? <laughs> Sorry, well, that wasn't me. Okay. Um, so the the intention here is that we're giving a foundation that then uh, system, you know, levels of the application uh, that are closer to those use cases can then build on to say all right for our use case here's what you have to sign um, wow. yeah the cookie one is an interesting one because uh depending on how your application's built depending on how your your sign you know what layer you're signing you're, you're doing your signing at you may or may not have access even to all of the cookies that are being passed through uh to be signed uh, potentially you've got advertising marketing cookies or tracking cookies that are getting stripped off, you know, before it hits your application server. Um, and the only one you really care about from a security model is your authorization cookie, you know, your, your session cookie. Um, and, you know, so that's where being able to sign specifically that one has a lot of value. Um, you mentioned content type. Yeah, content type can be really important to sign if you're signing over the body. If you're signing, you know, over like the digest or uh, header or something like that. Uh, if you're not, if you don't care about the response, the request or response body at all, then, you know, who, you know content type sure. doesn't matter. Sure. I realize we're short in time, so uh, uh, um, you know, I guess I, I'm just quickly, um, you know, um, this, this seems to. Uh, cut against, I think, the, the, the practice in the rest of the world where we're trying to design primitives which are safe to use. And this is a primitive which actually requires an enormous amount of like competence to use at all. Um, so like that, that so dig, digging that hole deeper seems sad. Um, and this is what DSync thought they were doing and it didn't work out at all. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I mean, uh, it's worth noting, I think that this is like, you know, the, the point where you're basically picking and choosing individual headers to sign, this is like basically weak sauce compression uh, over just covering, it's just stuffing the data directly in the signature itself. And it seems like that would have a lot clearer semantics. Namely, this is the stuff I actually mean, as opposed to, you know, here's the signature and then I'm supposed to go and like reassemble it. So uh, anyway, um, I'll stop now. All right, so next in queue we have Roberto. Hello, thanks Annabelle. This work uh, is uh, in queue for, our work group uh, for a long time. I just saw uh, some of the issues you filed. And uh, I think I have two main questions. The first one, I see in your slides and in the issues that you remove the expires uh, property from the signature. And uh, I think it is not a secure choice because as I sign something with my private key, I want to be in control of the mm -hmm. signature validity, not defer or delegate somebody else yep. uh, for the policy of, of signing. And the second question is that I like the signature input hypothesis. Uh, but it, I have my question is the there are some data just like the time interval uh, the validity of the signature for example created expires and some selected signature metadata I think they should be uh, conveyed together with the signature because. It's it's important for me that the signature is self-contained in one header, and the signed data could be outside, but the metadata, the signature validity, and some other selected information should be uh, in clear text together with the signature. 
Okay, um, I'll take those separately. First, regarding expires, that hasn't actually been removed. It's just not in any of my examples here uh, because fitting examples on a slide while keeping them legible is hard. Um, it's also optional uh, in the current text. Um, let's uh, let's continue the conversation on that one if we can through the the issues. Um, I'm you know personally I I I under I see both both sides of that argument. Uh, I created that issue mostly so we could you know have a place to have that conversation, not necessarily because I think yes we should remove it or not remove it. Um, so let's have that uh, through the the issue if we can. Um, the regarding your second uh, question, um, one the big thing that prompted me to break this out into two separate headers was, um, in part the the the, the limitations or the of what structured headers supports. Uh, if we want to be able to do things like parameters on uh, content identifiers, um, or if we want to have that content identifier list. Um, it, it starts to get hard to fit all of that into a single header, a structured header field. Um, if you also want to be able to do multiple signatures, and I do think multiple signatures is something we're going to want to support, both because of multiple parties, uh, you know, signing, you know, kind of ch chaining signatures together as the request or response passes through different systems. Uh, or because I need to sign parts of the request, uh, potentially different parts of the request for different audiences with different keys. Um, there's a number of different reasons why that might be uh, important for a uh, uh, for for a, a message sender to do. Um, I'm interested if you want to uh, maybe reply on list as to you know a little more context on if you have security concerns about separating the two. Uh, I think since we're covering the metadata in the signature itself uh, in this uh, proposed change, I, I think that uh, mitigates any any security concerns, but I, I'm curious if you know I'm missing something there. Uh, we're running a little over time, so I, I think we'll cut the queue and Annabelle, if you could run through the rest of your slides. Uh, um, yeah, minutes. honestly, um, let's, we can, cut it here. There's uh, other stuff going into other topics. If we had time, uh, I will raise those as um, uh, topics on the list. Um, preview of that is primarily it's around algorithm selection, identification, and how we couple that or not with the key definition. So we'll have fun with that one. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so that's a new draft. So everyone make sure you do take a look at it. Uh, we recently adopted. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to more discussion on the list as well as on the issues list. Um, next up is going to be uh, secondary certificates. Mike Bishop, are you with us? I am. Can everyone hear me? Get the, yep, let me get your presentation up just one second. Can people see that? No. Was that a no or a yes? Uh, it's loaded now. Okay, great. Take it away, Mike. Uh, so, Claude, we got some uh, good feedback on the last draft from one contributor. And so, this most recent update fixes a lot of the things that he pointed out. One of the most, um, most interesting changes is that now, instead of having one switch to turn the feature on or off and then letting the endpoints decide what to request or send, you can separately specify your support for client to server or server to client certificates. So that, for example, an implementation that wants to support client, uh, client certificates, but not let the server publish additional identities or vice versa can do that. Um, we've gotten uh, more, a more rational division of how errors are handled. 
So basically treating anything that's a misuse of the protocol is a stream error, but getting rid of stream errors for things like expired certificates and letting those just be handled at the HTTP level and say, okay, 403 not authorized because the certificate's expired or not trusted or whatever. Um, and then the last one is just editorial. There was already a, we had already changed it around to requiring the client to declare what certificate it intends to use to win a request, but we didn't state that the server must not consider any other certificates the client has published. So making it clear that if the client doesn't say you use the certificate, you don't use the certificate. So I would appreciate people looking at the most recent version of the draft to see if there's anything else that they would like to see touched up. But in large part, I think the draft is in good shape. Next slide. So what I'm seeing in discussions about this are that we've kind of got things going in two different directions here. This draft enables two main scenarios. On the client certificate side, it's a way to use client certificates in H2 and H3, where currently you can't really do that unless you request it at the beginning of the connection as part of the TLS handshake. And that kind of goes both directions. On one hand, there are people who want to discourage the use of client certificates as security practice and therefore don't want to add features to support it. And I understand that perspective. Um, and then the other side, you have people who have deployments with client certificates and would really like to be able to use H2 with them. We see kind of a similar split in usage on the server certificate side that it's great to be able to use a connection for an additional name without having to go through DNS or SNI and therefore expose the host name that you're asking about to the network. But on the other hand, the client asking about a particular certificate tells the server about host names that it might not actually be authoritative for. And so some browsers have said that they would be hesitant to do that piece. So we've kind of got current flowing both directions as to whether this is interesting to people. Next slide. So that kind of leads to, are we doing this? because I've gotten one useful review on the most recent draft. Uh, there were no, re no reviews on the PRs. I left them sit for a month before I merged them. And as far as I see, we don't yet have any client implementations of this. Now, Exported Authenticators is going for its, I think, third working group last call. So our dependency is about to be satisfied, but it's really difficult to look at moving this draft forward without some good implementations and some experience in playing it. Um, we have Watson Lad in queue. Okay. So uh, Watson Lad Cloudflare, um, we're very interested in this proposal. I just want to say that for the privacy concerns with, um, well, maybe I can know that's for, for Andy, but the privacy concerns we're thinking in terms of the server offering up certificates it knows about, it knows the client's interested because say there's sub resources on a page, which would be requested. Right, right. So I think that is the, the least privacy impacting way of doing server certificates, yes. So really it just feeds into if we're going to keep working on this draft, it would be really nice to have somebody able to commit to a client implementation. And if we don't have anyone able to do a client implementation, we need to have a conversation about what the future of this draft is. So Mike, this is your last slide, right? Yes. So um, just from my standpoint, um, you know, Tommy and I have been watching and, and talking about this one for a little while. And we, we were concerned that precisely about the issues you're raising here, Mike. Uh, so our, I, our, our thought was to talk about this in Vancouver. Uh, this is obviously our first chance to do that uh, since everything changed. And so we wanted to get feedback from everyone about whether we 
park this indefinitely, whether we push it out as experimental, whether we abandon it until we can get somebody to uh, um, uh, implement on the client side. I think that there are plenty of, of, of people who are interested on the server side, as Watson, Watson said. It's just a question of whether we can actually get somebody on the client side to implement it. Yeah, speaking again from a CDN perspective, from the Akamai side, we are interested in this to be able to allow customers who use client certificates to step up to H2. I will say that, you know, without my kind of server side head on, I am concerned about the amount of complexity it adds to the protocol. Uh, it, it seems like a very, there, there are potentially a lot of heuristics going on. There's a lot of, you know, question about which certificates you send when. And I know we've had mechanisms of similar complexity before that have added because they seem like they add efficiency, but they didn't work out in practice. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Suggestions on simplification also welcome. Do any client side folks want to speak up? Martin. Mine's on the draft. I so it's quite clear that I think this is worth doing at some level. The the problem for us has always been simply justifying the expense relative to the benefit. Um, and how we can fit, we can fit this on our roadmap when there's so many other things that are occupying the time of the teams that are involved. We're doing quick, we're doing all of these other things and it's just always been second to a bunch of other things. So it's not that we're not interested, it's that we just don't have the capacity to deal with it. Part of that is because it is a little bit complicated. It's gonna take a little bit of coordination and time to get right otherwise. Um, not opposed to it, it's just uh, just hard, that's all. Anyone else? I think me, um, Eric Scorla. Um, I mean, so we're the same, Martin and I are the same browser, but um, um, I think, I mean, one thing that might be worthwhile would be try to get a sense of like, the actual functionality is that, that is most people have enthusiasm for because my impression is that that, from, uh, that Watson is interested in the server ability at certificates and Mike's interested in the client's ability at certificates and those are actually quite different things with pretty different properties and um, you know when this was first floated my sense was it was like largely for the forward rather than the latter so um, uh, you know I mean to be frank browsers don't do an enormous amount of client authentication in the first place um, and and so I think our enthusiasm for that is probably correspondingly less than our enthusiasm for um, uh, the, for server authentication. So um, um, and, and yet that's a fair share of the complexity. Um, so uh, I think it might be worthwhile though, perhaps not now, to try to get a sense of like, you know, what what it is people actually wanted here, and if, if the balance is strong on one side or the other, that might help move the needle. If I can respond to that just very briefly. Um... The draft was originally written to support client certificates. Then there was a second draft that said, hey, you could use the same mechanism to publish server certificates. And then they were merged. Um, the separating out the settings means that it's entirely possible to implement one side of it without implementing the other, and which is a change from previous draft versions. But all the same mechanisms are used in both directions. I may think that's perhaps true on the wire, but much as with much as with the uh, much with the previous um, uh, document, um, the complexity is reasoning about it, not not writing down the wire pieces. Sure. I wanted to add to that that the complexity around getting UX right and making sure that you correctly wire up all of your requests with the right certificates and all that sort of thing is non-trivial. When we've looked at it, it's just, that's where the complexity lies. You can, you can plumb the TLS stack relatively easily. You can plumb the HTTP stack with work, but 
the rest of it is kind of kind of tricky too. So anyone else in the queue? I move on. I think we should move on. Yeah, Tommy. Uh, we'll, we'll chat about this one later on, perhaps. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback, everyone. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Next up would be digest headers. Can everybody, everybody see this one? Take it away. Great. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize uh, about the slides. I sent them out like three weeks ago, but somehow managed to mangle them with kind of a version from uh, Singapore in some way. So I had to update these shortly before the presentation. The good news is that the issues that we had there are still relevant. So anyone who did read ahead, um, you, you're not missing much. Uh, but we've only got a few slides here. Um, so let's take it away. Next slide, please. Um, just a very brief overview of who's using, and I use that a bit loosely, but these are these are things we're aware of that uh, reference digest headers in some ways. So we've got most content coding, uh, signature specs, um, where they want to protect the payload body and sign the digest header as a means of doing that, um, and some banking APIs um, also via use of signatures. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so since we last presented, um, there's been some changes, uh, nothing nothing huge, another editorial sweep to try and improve some of the readability and presentation of the data. Um, if anyone's looked at the draft, you'll see there's a, a huge section of, of examples to help try and explain some of the nuances of using digests. And, you know, uh, while what Roberto and I have discussed whether they're they're useful. They, they definitely helped our process of, of working through stuff. Um, I'd like some feedback on if, if people think that they belong in the document as an appendix um, or if, if we just get rid of them in the long term. Um, but at the moment, we just try to readjust things to help the readability. Um, while doing that, we've also put an emphasis on the representation digest, just a terminology clarification. That's where we started and we kind of meandered away, um, but we're trying to bring that back to the fore. Um, we've added some clarification on the digest of error responses, um, and we've been trying to update our terminology uh, to align with HP Core. So this is mainly uh, a clarification around the term of, of HTTP field so the digest can appear in a in a header or a trailer, um, effectively, depending on how you might want to use it. So, so we're being careful to allow both of those use cases by using this new terminology. Um, so, so we're making progress, but we've got some issues that are kind of a bit blocking, and we'd like some help to move on, either to close them if no one cares, or to get some input and help uh, direct us in the right way. So next slide, please. Um, there, are, there are more issues than this in the um, in the tracker. If anyone wants to go to that link at the bottom and look at them, uh, but these three slash four are kind of the main um, ones we just want to highlight today. So uh, we have the relationship with validators and cache. Um, we also have this this weird parameter spec gap. Um, those are fairly easy. I think if we can get an answer, we can probably prepare some text and just land it with some review and and be done with it. The, the less straightforward one is uh, this 970, um, which I'll explain in a couple of slides. So if we go on to the next, just address each of these issues one by one. Um, for some reason, the ordering got messed up from what you just saw. But yeah, this parameter spec gap, uh, you know, the, the previous version of this document, RFC 3230, uh, states uh, this text. For some algorithms, one or more parameters may be supplied. Uh, the BMF for parameters is used in 2616. All digest algorithm values are case insensitive. Um, and that's all it really said about the matter. There's no example of parameter anywhere. Um, and, and the reference to the BNF while we're updating this document probably needs updating. Um, and so, you know, in the interest of maintaining digests, uh, we've just imported this text verbatim, but it, it, it's kind of a bit wonky and we 
don't really know the best way to solve this thing without examples of parameter or, or how to document this thing. Uh, that's all there is to say about that one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, cache digest and cache validator. So 3230, the previous spec said uh, instance. So so remember they they their terminology was instance digests, uh, which you know we're updating to to be more compliant with core terminology. Uh, but but what they said is it's specified by the request URI and any cache validator. And in our new terms, we say the resource is specified by the effective request URI and any validator field. And, and there's been some commentary about this last time around. Um, I think you know we we're not quite sure what what specify means in this context. And I believe in Singapore, maybe Mark made a comment that that actually um, just important some of these terms doesn't help. And there's a there's a slightly better way for us to um, reword things within the document. Uh, that would just tidy up all of these slightly confusing things. Um, I don't know if that's still the case, um, but yeah, we would appreciate some help there if anyone can find the time. Next slide, please. Um, and then there's this one, which uh, stems back to a comment that Julian made at some time, some place, somewhere. Uh, which is, I I just don't think that it would be a good idea to vary the semantics of digest based on the request method. Um, so we can we can address that by some rewording, um, but but I think Roberto is a bit concerned that that might prevent something. Um, you know, do any present or future methods that convey a partial representation, um, you know, and and if there are, how do we couch things to describe? The way that digest would be used, and, and should it always be computed over the complete representation or some partial nature of it? Um, yeah, that there's an there's the issue. There's some background on there. I don't know if that's just something we can take on offline um, and and have Julian and, and Roberto maybe discuss that a bit more with some input um, on the list. I, I, I don't know. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so that's it. Um, we're continuing to work away. If anyone hasn't read the document for a while, um, yeah, we we would re welcome some more review and input. Uh, but otherwise, I, th I think we're, we're getting there eventually. So thanks from both Roberto and I. Thank you. Um, we have Mark in queue. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's going to be worth it to go into the details here, and I probably need more context, but I think I can help you with at least some of those issues, and I'm sure Julian can help you out as well. <clears throat> so please feel free to you know ping us if you don't hear from us soon on the issues. Um, some of it goes down to some fairly you, you know you're, you're you've taken on the the joyous task of revising a very old HTTP specification which diverged in the timeline from from the, where, where everything else went. So there's some Fairly hairy issues there as you're discovering, uh, but yeah, yeah I'll definitely try to help, help you out. Help you out. Yeah, I think you know. I'd say speaking for Roberto, who might want to correct me, but you know, we we have the time to to spend on you know um, wordsmithing and editorial work. I don't see there being huge like technical issues with making progress on this document, which is I think as most people would expect because it's just a document update. Um, and we've been careful not to to extend the scope of this work in in any way. Um, so yeah, if if we can get our heads together, then um, I'd like to to try and continue to drive the progress here. So help is appreciated. Yes, actually, we we can't move from those issues alone. We need some historical knowledge about HTTP. That. We do not have. Okay. Uh, I think it, at the first go, uh, myself and Julian can try and help you out. And if necessary, we'll try and pull Roy in because he goes back a bit further than we do with some of this stuff. Um, anything else? Uh, Watson is in queue. Yeah, there's a quick note. Uh, the draft, it's, it seems to indicate that the part of the goal is to protect against buggy compression methods. But if I'm looking through his examples and understand what's computed over correctly, 
if you had, say, a proxy that's taking in zip compressed data on one side and pumping out broadly on the other, it's going to change the digest. It's not computed on the content, but rather the content encoding. And so it's, I don't think that you actually protect against a bug in the gzip or broadly implementation that changes the data being passed through with the draft as currently specified. Uh, I, I think that the content encoding is a property of the representation. So any intermediary probably is not allowed to, to change it, but maybe I'm mistaken. An intermediary should cha could change the transfer coding, but not the content coding. That is something like the, co the content type. An intermediary is not supposed to change the content type as it's not supposed to change the content coding. Is, is that true? It's evidently possible I am confused on this point. Um, this this might be something Watson and I can can take offline and and um, yeah I, I can see maybe we need to to discuss through some of the scenarios here and and uh, I'll take a task to to reflect anything back into an issue or a list uh, item if, if people are happy with that. Thank you very much, gentlemen. See my DOS attack on Eckers network is working, which is fantastic. Next up, we have uh, cookies with my quest. Mike, are you with us? Hey, folks. I'm getting a lot of artifacts from a number of different people, so hopefully my audio is coming through. I hear you loud and clear. Excellent. So there are no slides for this session. Uh, I want to give two high-level updates and uh, hopefully spur some conversation around the second. The first update is related to RFC, RFC 6265 bis uh, specifically. That continues to plod forward slowly. I promised Mark that I would have it done by the end of Q1. Uh, I am now looking at the end of Q2 in despair. It is not quite done yet. I think we are in the fixing niggly issues stage of things. And I would note that web platform tests have been quite helpful in giving us insight into the way that different browsers treat cookies today and helping us understand the ways in which browsers have diverged from the spec on the one hand and the ways that browsers have diverged from each other on the other. I think we've made good progress, especially in the 05 and 06 versions of the draft at fixing a couple of long outstanding issues. And my expectation is that we'll be able to fix the remainder in a relatively short period of time. I've said that before, but this time it might actually be true. If you look at the web platform tests, browsers generally uh, are beginning to converge on a set of behaviors, which I think is good. The web platform test for the domain attribute in particular are pretty buggy, like the tests are buggy, not the behaviors. Um, that's something that requires a couple of infrastructure changes or one infrastructure change to web platform tests to allow it to begin a test on a different domain than it currently does. But it's quite reasonable to do and seems like something that we'll be able to get done. The majority of the outstanding issues on the RFC are around the same site attribute, which is added in the BIS. That needs some work. It turns out that browsers that, uh, or user agents generally that have shipped support for same site have done so based on different versions of previous drafts. Uh, which means that there's some divergent behavior between uh, user agents that I think we need to come to agreements on. I expect us to be able to do that because many of the questions that are being asked in those issues have reasonably clear answers or have agreement between at least uh, two widely used user agents already. 
There are some other larger outstanding issues like support for UTF, <clears throat> excuse me, support for UTF, UTF-8 in header values. Um, that is a large problem. It's one that I think is going to be uh, non-trivial to change within the context of this update. And I wonder whether it's something that we ought to spend time on in and put in scope for the BIS or whether we should continue punting that down the road for someone else to deal with. Like many issues around cookies, that feels to me to be important, but not urgent, um, much like the rest of the specification, uh, to be perfectly blunt, and something that we need to decide whether we want to spend time on it now or whether we want to continue punting it. RFC to the side. I see the second part of the update is that browsers continue to experiment with the default behaviors uh, for cookies above and beyond what is specified in the draft RFC. I'll note a couple of them here as examples, but I would also note that there are uh, a number of other things that user agents and browsers in particular are beginning to play around with. First, I would point to the work that Chrome is doing with regard to changing the default value of the same site attribute. We were almost able to get same site lacks as a default out the door uh, earlier in this year. Uh, we ended up rolling it out to about 50% in stable. We rolled it back in early April due to some unexpected breakage at a particularly bad time for web developers. Uh, we have it rolled out at 50% for non-release channels, that is Canary, Dev, and Beta. And my expectation is that we will try to roll it out to stable again, probably over the summer. I would also note that Safari has begun blocking third-party cookies entirely as of uh, late March. Gaining access to those uh, cookies on the storage access API, which is being discussed in the privacy community group in the W3C. So if you're interested in that, it would be uh, a good idea to hop over to that community group. Finally, I would note that uh, the editor's draft of incrementally better cookies uh, is Probably interesting to some folks on the list. Uh, I've posted a couple of updates to the working group mailing list, uh, but I would point people in particular to the scheme bound cookies proposal, as well as the schemeful same site proposal that are described in that draft. And I would particularly invite feedback on section 3.6 of the draft, which tries to propose a different definition of what a session means than we currently have uh, in most user agents. Those are my updates. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Um, we have a couple people in queue. Um, first, Annabelle. Hey, Annabelle Backman, AWS. Uh, first of all, just thanks for taking on this uh, difficult work. Um, Coming at this from a service provider and uh, identity provider standpoint, a lot of the you know, changes that are talked about here with same site and some of the other uh, non RFC changes that you talked about um, are you know potentially impacting you know, the legitimate cross uh, origin uh, use cases uh, and have tended to be tripping up uh, identity providers in some use scenarios, people doing OAuth 2, OpenID Connect. Um, how much outreach is there uh, between you know, the, the, the teams working on these spec changes and you know, that, you know, like the ID, identity provider community? Um, what's the right venue for us to kind of keep up with what's going on here and and uh, share, you know, challenges and counter or problems that we're encountering with this. 
I have two answers to your question. Um, one is that the changes that browsers as user agents in particular are making are broad in scope and go well beyond cookies and well beyond HTTP. A lot of the conversation around those changes more generally is happening in the privacy community group in the W3C and uh, also the web incubation community group in the, w and the uh, W3C. My suggestion would be that the right set of people to talk to about the broad set of changes that browsers want to be making are going to be in one of those groups. Um, and it seems like the center of mass at the moment is the privacy community group. So I would recommend uh, hopping over there for some of the, to, to keep your eyes on some of the conversations. The second answer is more specifically towards identity. Um, I think that identity is something that is clearly broken by some of the changes that browsers want to make to the way that state on the web is persisted. And I also think that there's a, a, a reasonably well shared understanding that that breakage is undesirable. The challenge is to find a way to maintain the good stuff that we like about transferring identity and transferring assertions of identity between entities on the web while not enabling the kind of wild west that we see on the web today, given the side effects that it has and the way that those side effects affect users. I, I think it would be quite reasonable for user agents to have uh, some distinct primitive for identity uh, that y'all, uh, well, not just y'all, but folks interested in doing OAuth in particular would be able to hook into. Um, I think that if something like that is proposed, it would happen in one of those two W3C groups. Well, thank, thank you for that. I you know, appreciate that. Um, I, I'll just, no, one one challenge of looking for a kind of browser level or user agent level uh, change like that is you know, there's obvious deployment challenges there, but that's when we can pursue that conversation uh, in probably the you know, W3C spaces. I think you're probably right. That's where it would happen. Um, I would ask uh, uh, as far as 62, 65 bits, um, I, I haven't like, deeply read through it, but I don't recall seeing any kind of e examples around or thorough examples around the behavior of same site. Uh, maybe I missed them, but that's something where I think a kind of clear set of sort of test case examples uh, would be really helpful for uh, a, a, website developers uh, to understand how this thing is actually going to affect, how the, how the different values are actually going to affect them. Um, that's one of the problems we've had with talking to teams you know, as, uh, internally is like, well, I, I, what is this actually going to mean for, you know, our, this use case, that use case? Um, and it's, it's, you know, been kind of difficult to, uh, to, to determine that in some cases. I would suggest that you file an issue and we will do our best to get some examples into the document. Will do. Cool. And I think there are yeah. some examples, but I grant completely that they are not exhaustive. Sure. Now, thank, thanks again for the, for the work on this. It's, it's good stuff. We also have uh, Martin in queue. Yeah. Um, large digression about what the future of cookies for on the web is here. Um, one thing that I think is fairly clear from all of this is that this is going to be a moving target over the next little while, potentially almost indefinitely, given the nature of the beast. So um, what I'm curious about is what you see the endpoint being uh, for this one, personally, Mike, and other people who have other opinions as well. So I think that you're entirely correct that there's going to be iterative change over time and that it's difficult to say today what the exact end state is going to be. 
I personally think that an end state along the lines of the HTTP state tokens proposal would be pretty reasonable. There are some things that I would change about that proposal um, and that I intend to write up at some point, but that direction uh, seems still seems good to me. The changes that are suggested in the cookie incrementalism draft uh, that I linked in the minutes are intended to be piecemeal steps towards that kind of end state. I hope that's an answer to your question. Yeah, I, th I think this is this is a good answer that one one that the ITF is really uncomfortable with, um, which is to say that um, this will take time, and there are a number of points in time at which we have documentation that matches reality. Uh, but then reality will pull ahead again, or the documentation will pull again ahead again in different ways, and we'll just have to work out how to deal with that. But we're not going to be publishing an RFC that says what. Um, what the state of the, the cookies world is as of um, May 27, 2020. It's just not going to happen. I mean, we're, we're certainly not going to be doing that given the pace at which I am currently working. <laughs> so that's right. an and, and I don't think anyone expects anything. Yeah, I don't think anyone expects anything. But if if the goal is um, to, to eventually um, continue to push the cookie thing towards something that's a little less um, weird, then then that would be good. Um, sort of coming back to this UTF-8 issue, I had to refresh my memory, go back and dig up the the, uh, the issue. But if the behavior of browsers is consistent but not documented, I think we're in a bit of a poor state. So. I don't know what to do about that because it's a lot of work, but um, it would be really nice if we understood what the real world is and have that documented somehow. So one, one thing I would note here is that there is a real opportunity for someone who cares about that kind of problem and who has free time to uh, take it on. Uh, to be perfectly blunt, that's not something that I have time to do, nor is it high on my priority list. Uh, although I agree with you that it is important, it doesn't feel urgent to me, going back to this uh, distinction that I mentioned earlier. Um, if folks, if there is anyone interested in helping the cookies draft move faster in these kinds of places or really any others, uh, I would certainly appreciate help, uh, period. Uh, Mark? to remind my colleague from the great state of New South Wales that reality is bigger than just browsers. We need to consider other things too. Yes, but you know the rules. Yeah, the rules. I won't, won't remind you of them. Thank you, Mike. Um, and we have one last topic from Mark. Yes, but we're doing well on time. Uh, if you haven't signed the blue sheet here, which is in the uh, etherpad, please get in there. We have 30 people on the list, and yet 40 people at one point were in the WebEx, so that's interesting. Uh, let's see, how do I do this? Okay, people are asking for a link. I'll paste another link to these. Okay, great, great. Yeah. See if we can stay away through this one. Okay, that's not working. Um, WebEx. Hmm. Oh, thank you, WebEx. Okay. Can you see this? Content length is weird. Content length is weird. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, I'm going to talk quickly about this draft and uh, hopefully we'll have time for some substantial discussion about it. So um, I filed an issue on HTTP core uh, earlier this year uh, with the same title content like this weird. Uh, and that eventually begat a draft and that's the draft we're talking about today. Draft Nottingham, but shed length zero zero. Um, 
in a nutshell, we can get down here. Uh, it's weird because it serves more than one purpose. Um, we use content length in HTTP 1.x for message delimitation. Uh, that is by nature extremely security sensitive. There's lots of different kinds of attacks that can take advantage of, of uh, control over message delimitation, as hopefully everyone's aware. Um, and so typically it's not under direct application control. We, we constrain uh, lots of different HTTP implementations to constrain access to content length. And it's only used for this purpose in 1.x. But we also have cases where content length is used to set peer expectations about size. So, for example, when you want to uh, send a post, uh, a lot of servers require you to send a content length so they can decide whether or not they want to accept three gigabytes of data or whatever it's going to be. Or on the client side, when you're getting a response, uh, a browser can use or another client can use a content length to show download properties. Uh, with, with chunked encoding or, or with HTTP2 framing, you don't have that capability. You just have how, how big is the next chunk. Um, and great precision is not necessarily needed for that. It's not security sensitive, it's just setting expectations. Um, and, and so, you know, we talk about the security aspects of this. You, you need careful guard, guardrails around content length. Uh, HTTP 1 in the spec, we forbid content length in any mess with transfer encoding uh, because then you can have two different values and you get confused about it. Uh, and, and in fact, even when the next hop is in HTTP 1, you still need to consider that one beyond it might be, you might have. HP2 to a CDN, for example, but it's using HTTP1 in the back end or something. And as a result, HTTP2 and HTTP3 both require content length of message to match the bytes in the wire. Um, there's a bit of a caveat there in that the recipient may not realize that it doesn't match until the end of the message, in which it's too late. It's already forwarded most of the message to the next consumer somewhere. Um, and it might be able to truncate the message, but not do much else. So that's not great either. And so, the proposal in this draft is, is to separate these uses. It's to, to create a new header field for conveying an advisory length for those latter use cases. Um, it's leaving content length just for message delimitation. Of course, if people want to use it for that purpose, we're not going to stop them. We can't. Um, but it's, it's to try to separate those so we don't have the same constraints and the same guardrails around this advisory length so that it can be exposed to applications a little more freely. Uh, the name is a bike shed. That's why it's called a bike shed. Uh, it has the same syntax as content length, but would probably make it a uh, structured field. Uh, no constraints about when and when it can't be sent and so forth and so on. It's, it's just, you know, open for interpretation. The presumption being that, you know, if, if you send this header, for example, in a post request, the recipient, the server will look at that and say, oh, he says he's going to send me three gigabytes. I guess I'll accept that. But then as you're reading in the message, you make sure that he doesn't send more than, much more than three gigabytes so that, you know, you can't be attacked in that fashion. Um, so the question then at the working group, we, we talked about this in the mailing list uh, for a little while. There seemed to be a, a reasonable amount of interest. Uh, is standardizing this header field helpful? And if so, should it be in the semantic draft uh, because we're working on that and it's relevant there and it's a rel relatively small new addition or should we keep it separate? That's all I've got. Any comments? James? Uh, I think this header is helpful and I think it probably belongs in the semantics document. And uh, Julian? If we want to put it into the semantics document, does that affect the standards level that we can achieve? Meaning it's a new feature, right? So could that be in and still be a full standard, full internet standard? Just asking. Good question. I don't know if it's a really a new feature. It's just some new syntax for existing semantics. That that would, would be a, if, if that was a blocker, we'd probably want to keep it out. I mean, it feels like you'd want some level of um, implementation experimentation around it before we say it's standards track, but that it shouldn't be too high of a bar. Uh, Martin, I just Mark said it's a basically existing semantics. What existing semantics is maybe this big. I think this is entirely new, isn't it? Um, it's what people, it, it's 
the current use case of what some people use content link for, but it's also used for other things. Yeah, it's just mainly because people use content length because it happens to be correct in most cases. Um, it's not correct in every case. Well, yeah, like as you like well you know, said, as I well know, um, I, this seems pretty clear um, as an as an extension to me. I, I don't think there's anything that requires it go in the core semantics document, um, and I'm a little uncertain about how much someone can do with this. I mean, if someone sends you three gigabytes and then the file is three bytes long, is that wrong? Probably not, right? Yeah. So it's, it's really just very advisory. Um, I don't know how to set a progress bar for that, but right. I guess we'll see. Well, and that's the interesting part to me. I'm, I'm much less interested in talking about where it ends up and more into, you know, you know would Firefox, you know, key, it, 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 key its browser uh, progress bar on this if it were present and content link weren't, let's say. Would, would that be yeah, interesting? I, I think that's that's clearly the use case that people are considering here, and it, it seems perfectly reasonable to do that. I see a lot of cases where you get you know undefined amount of data left remaining because someone's used junk encoding or what have you, and and they didn't provide a content length, and maybe they did that because they really weren't sure how much was there. But if they could say well, it was maybe a hundred hundred meg, then that would be quite useful, I think. For me, the, uh, the slightly more interesting case, I, I think that's probably the more prevalent case, but if we could start using chunked encoding or, or you know, yeah, chunked encoding for post requests and setting this instead of content length, that would be, that would be interesting, I think. Uh, Introducing that is going to take some work. Yeah, and, and dynamic compression is the other one that, that, that springs to mind. You've, you've got... 100 megabytes of stuff to send, and your compression ratio is in the order of 50%. So you say 50, carry on. Barry? Um, one possible solution, how, how long do you think it would take to get a document with just this in it out the door? How long will it take for the semantics document to get respun for internet standard? The answer might be that get this out, get some experimentation, get some get some implementation with it, and then by the time the semantics document is done, you know whether you want to roll this into it or not. This document's going to be done pretty soon. Yeah, we we would like to have that done, and and we do get a new version of that, right? Yes, just today. Yep. Saw that. I, I, I don't want this, to, you know, the, the destination to be the big deciding factor here. If it's a separate document, that's fine. I, I think if you want semantics to go to internet standard soon, this needs to be state kept separate. I personally don't have any great feelings about internet standard, but I know that Julian might get on a plane and come to Australia and do something to me if I stop it becoming internet standard. So, do we have any other thoughts from the group? So, I, I would characterize what I heard as continuing mold interest, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and keeping it as an extension now, I think it would be useful to hear um, more implementer interest, both from client side and server side, um, see how people want to use this, but yeah. I'll issue another draft and uh, try and work the use cases a bit more so people can see what that means. And uh, maybe even try to give it a name. <laughs> All right. I think we're out of time, right? Yeah. All right. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Um, Thank you, everybody. Hopefully, we'll see you all soon. And thanks to our note takers as well. Yes, thank you.
Bye, everyone.